Can anybody tell me what project management is about? It's about making, about making sure that you have stuff done on time, you're making use of your resources and not wasting anything, basically. I do. So you've got the task, you're breaking the task down into subtasks, and you have to actually meet the deadlines for that specific project. What about software engineering? Actually building the software. That's actually building the software, it's actually designing, programming, etc. Where does the HCI come in? That's the sort of the, the human side of making sure the, the software is sort of appropriate for its end users. So it's a part of software engineering. It's making sure that your product is usable by your end users. And product management actually sits on top of all of this and enables us to decide what products to create and how to actually produce and tell software engineers and project managers what to do in the nutshell. <coughs> so I think he saw this in the first intro if you were there. And this is my crude, crude summary of what we talked about. So project management is all about getting the task done on time. But we need to know whether that project is going to make money. And the product management is deciding what to build, how to build it, how to sell it and how to keep it going until it dies. Okay, you've seen this before. So just quickly, the module is going to take place here except for next week. Please note that next week and I'll talk to you whoever's doing next week. You're going to Dalhousie 2 12 because we've got something in here and in the seminar. Week 7 and 8 will be RIS and consultants. Week 10, you've got a week off to finish your project. Week 11, you will present your project. And then week 12, I will give you a revision lecture. So from now on, all the sessions are Thursday mornings in here, except for next week. Please note that this can change. If we have to change it, we will let you know in advance. <coughs> Has everyone got access to the module on my done um, What I haven't uploaded is David's session for today, but I will. Is it? I just wanted to check that that's okay. what you were using, so I had to put it down. There, are, there is a reading list for this module, and it's linked from my dandy, 
and we've got exam papers etc there as well. So, the horrible part, how are we going to assess you? The MSCs have an essay and the project, the honour students have the project and both lots do the exam. Because of past feedback and the amount of work you put into the project, we have increased the um, sort of amount from 40-60 to 50-50. So 50% is called work, 50% is exam. The MEC essay, you've got that on Blackboard. You've got enough information. If anyone wants to talk to me about the essay, please come and see me. In terms of the coursework, David will be explaining more about the project but all the handing, the technical stuff, I'm the go-to person. Okay? So remember that. Don't believe or David tell you in terms of deadlines, etc. I have the last say for that. Yeah? Okay. And I probably listen to him anyway. So the deadline for the essay is in week nine. Both groups will do the project. <coughs> do you want to say something quickly about that? I, or I, 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 I can do it when we get to So basically this is really exciting and you'd find out more from David later. I think, in fact, David, here's the issue which I know you will be asking me for. Thank you. So, you part of today and this week will be to look at coming together in teams of about three or four people, three minimum four men. There are nine MECs, so I suggest three groups of three, and the honours, there are 13 of you, so three groups of four and one of five, but we'll think about that a bit later. And I won't go into this because David will say more. There is a full brief on Blackboard. The one thing I do need to tell you before David takes over, please be aware that this module actually encompasses a whole lot of soft skills. We are going to do legal stuff in the IP, patents, copyrights, etc. Ethical, all the ethical knowledge you have, you are going to have to treat people ethically, interviews, Never ever tell us who's told you what. Confidentiality, etc. is paramount. Professional, you will learn a lot while you interact with professionals at a very high standard. And social issues, when we are designing for the market, 
we need to remember that diversity and all the stuff we've learned about accessibility, etc., doesn't get forgotten. You have to put that all into the work here. Okay, the last bit here, we listen to what you've said in previous years. So, people really, really like this course. A lot of students have actually got jobs, correct, through the interaction with them. Um, challenges need improvement. We try to structure and also break up the sessions into smaller bits. So David's got um, sort of gives you breaks every now and then. Students find the session the whole morning quite obvious, but it's the only way we can run this module. So please bear with us. And we try to put in more detail of what we want you to do for the assignment and the links with the exam. So, um, are there any questions before I hand it over to David? Could you also talk about teams, etc.? So, are there any questions before I hand over? No? Again, anything to do with the management, organisation of the module, come and see me. Okay. Okay. You're on. And I normally stay for a few minutes because I love listening. <laughs> All right, thank you, Anna Lou. Um, so, my name is David Farker. Um, this is the 10th year. Really? It's not. It is, yeah. Oh, 2007. That's yeah. why I'm so great. <laughs> <laughs> You're great. Um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is our anniversary, so uh, thank you very much for turning up. Could I ask a favour, and this is of real interest to the people who will be giving their time to help you. Um, I'm going to pass the sheet now. Could you just write down where you come from? Whether it's you know, the country you come from, or if it's more local, just the town you come from. Um, that would be great. You can pass that around. If anybody wants, my card is here. I'll leave them there, and you can get a hold of them um, at the end. Um, um, yeah, that can be a way. Yeah. Smashing. I'm just going to set up, hopefully, and my computer here. Um, if we're lucky, is it HDMI or is it? The I can do either. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, there are twenty two of you on this course. I my, I've got it on there. All we've got to do is get it up there. Sorry, can I interrupt? There's, there's a, only the VGA works. So only the VGA? You, want to, you might have to have a, an adapter for it, yeah. Yeah, I've got an adapter. But yeah. I had the same problem the other day, so. Alright, thank you. There's two, there's two buttons below the desk which have to be, it's either green or orange, but if you flip them to the opposite colour they are, 
um, that should change the display. See on the, the right hand side? Yes. So, yeah, both orange and that should work. Oh, switched it off. Ha! You've passed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You will very quickly learn I know nothing about technology. <laughs> this is a school of. <laughs> And this is where my expertise ends. <laughs> Are we good? smooth start. Um, as I said, my name is David Farker. I am not a technologist. I'm a chef by training um, who became a soldier and ended up in the technology sector totally by accident 25 years ago. Um, I haven't left it since um, because I just love it so much. Um, I have been the CEO of about eight or nine companies. You can find me easily enough on LinkedIn. Um, I have worked almost exclusively in enterprise software. So software sold to businesses uh, to improve their performance in some way, as opposed to consumer software, um, which is sold to individuals. It's quite an important distinction as we learn about product management. Um, I started doing this about 10 years ago because having been a CEO several times, I'd started making angel investments. So relatively modest, you know, 25 to 100,000 type investments in other people's startup companies, uh, some of which worked, some of which didn't. Um, but one of the things that some friends and I who were co-investing discovered was that there is a, um, a discipline that exists in the global software sector, which is always regarded as vital right at the beginning of building a business in the United States, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, but it's very, actually very rarely done over here. And that's the discipline of product management. And what this part of your module aims to teach you is what product management is, um, what product management isn't, uh, and why it matters. And as uh, Anilu said, you will do an exam, uh, the questions of which have been uh, formulated by some of my colleagues who are practitioners. Um, you will also do this project that she's talked about, and when we get to our halftime break in this lecture, um, I'll explain to you what the project is and how it runs. Um, with 22 students, I'm going to suggest seven groups. Okay. So six of three and one of four. Yeah. Um, I don't care what, how they're made up. You, you guys can figure that out. Um, but what I will need is a list of who's in what group so that we can match people so up. So I suggest six. So we've got seven groups. One to seven. By the end of this week, maybe Thursday, if I can have emails stating who's in your group. Oh, you can do six groups if you like. I mean, that would be what a bunch of fours and a three or something. Six is easier for the presentation. Right. So that's four sixes and a couple of threes. Yeah. So. If you want to do it that way, that's absolutely fine. It just means you get less money at the end, because there is a 
cash prize because this is a commercial course. So you decide. Okay. Um, okay. So product management, as Anna Lou said, is absolutely vital um, if you're going to build a successful business. Just out of interest, how many of you plan to leave here and do something commercial? Um, uh, let's start with who would who's got a plan to do a startup? Two of you, okay. Who's got a plan to go and get a job? The majority of you. And who plans to go uh, carry on in academia, either in research or whatever? Okay, all right. Um, if you want to get a job, um, which most of you do, this discipline will help you enormously. Whether you plan to go into the software sector or anything to do with IT, or whether you plan to go and be a software specialist in a completely different sector like banking, this will stand you in extremely good stead. And the, the, the colleagues of mine who are going to support you and men, mentor you in doing your project come from all kinds of different angles and have worked in all kinds of different industries, but they've all been product managers at one point or another. Cornflakes has a product manager. Um, my Audi A7 has a product manager. Uh, our software has a product manager. They all fundamentally do the same job. So what we are teaching you might be the specific techniques as to how to be a product manager within the enterprise software sector, but actually the principles apply in any good business that is making a product. And the best way to think about a product is something that is designed once and sold and made many times. So this desk, okay, how does it work? It works like that, right? Each one of these was designed by, um, or um, specified by a product manager. Then the guys went away and, and thought, how do we build this? What materials do we use? How do we architect it? And so on. But the fact that it had to fit into a lecture theatre like this, and be able to do that specifically so that you could walk along here and then have a flat surface, that was done by a product manager. Okay? Based upon something you're probably familiar with, a user story. Yeah? You know about user stories? Who doesn't know about user stories? It's okay to not know about the user stories. The MVC logs, I need learning it's here. Okay. This is a user story. As a student at Dundee University, if I have a lecture in the Wilson Hall, I want to be able to walk, sit in my seat, and then get a flat surface to work on. Because the, what would I call that? Corridors within the theatre are very narrow. Um, I, you know, I, I, I need a special kind of desk to enable me both to get past and to have a flat surface. Does that make sense? That's a user story. What I've not done is describe how I'm going to solve the problem. What I have done is I've captured it from your point of view because you're the customer. Yeah. Actually, the university is the customer, and they're buying it on behalf of you. But you get the point, right? So that is a great user story. Okay, does that make sense? A lot of what you're going to learn is about uh, understanding what the user stories should be for your purpose and how to groom them and nurture them and make decisions about them. Because we can't build everything at once. Okay? So we're going to learn a lot about all this kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to do two things today. Um, before we have a break, we're going to do A. And after we have a break, we're going to do B. And when we go to do the break, I'll describe the project uh, that you, you have to do uh, to you. Okay, and each at the end of each of these lectures, um, we will give you an assignment. That is not because we like giving homework. I have a 14-year-old daughter who's doing her nat force and is going pure mental at the moment because she's got too much bloody homework. So I get it. Each bit of homework you're given will be part of your project, right? So this is not an academic thing or a waste of time. It's a practical thing and it will help you. And what you'll do, I'll give you an assignment this week. You'll give feedback to you and on it next week. And you will give you feedback as to whether you're on the right lines or not, okay? So our job is to help you to succeed at this, not to try and trip you up, okay? All right. Um, this is what we're going to try to achieve today. Um, we're doing it from the context of actually being guys that run companies. Okay, so what you're going to get is not theoretical, it's practical. Um, having said that, we've made it slightly generic so it can be applied to lots of different kind of situations. 
okay? Um, and this really is, is the key thing. If you are going to be a successful company, I mean, this is going to sound unbelievably obvious, but a lot of people don't think about it, is wouldn't it be a good idea if, you saw, if your product solved a problem that somebody cared about? Because that's why they'll pay money for it, right? You can go off, you can have made these triangular and scooped. Probably wouldn't have sold very many of those, would we? Right? So we've made them square and flat, because guess what? That's kind of the shape of your laptop. Okay? All right. So that's what we're going to try and do. Um, we're not going to teach you anything about software engineering. You will learn some stuff about the practicalities of design. But basically, there are four lectures. My one is an introduction, and it gives you the business context for what this is and why we do it. Next week, my esteemed colleague, Ewan Spears, uh, Ewan is uh, a Scot originally, but he now lives in Texas. He's back next week doing some work, um, and he's kindly coming up to do the lecture. Um, and he is head of global head of product strategy. His previous role was as product manager. Okay. Um, the week after that, a chap called Joe Ross is going to be over, and Joe is going to go from product strategy to pure product management. Okay. And Joe is the global head of product management for one of the two main uh, products in the company. Uh, Joe is an American, he's from Detroit. Um, he again is over that week, and so that's why you've got three lectures, bang, 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 one after the other. Um, so, and Joe will be coming up here totally confused, he'll be totally in the wrong time zone. Um, it'll be three in the morning for him, um, but he's a really great guy and uh, you'll, you'll love hearing from him. Um, the final lecture is a double header. Um, so Russell Cooper, who was a product owner and is now a product manager. I'll explain all the difference between these things in a minute. Uh, and uh, Christina Porter. Christina is our UX designer. So you're gonna learn both about the product owner role and how it interfaces with engineering on a day-to-day -day basis. And you'll learn about how design is built into the entire process. Because it's fine, you know, knowing what you want to do but as we said earlier, getting the design right is enormously important. And that fits really well with the HCI stuff that you learn elsewhere uh, during your degree. Okay? Is that okay? That's four lectures. And then at the end of November, beginning of December, um, you come and you get to stand down here. We will have a panel of four um, experienced people from industry here. You will present to them as if they were the board of your company, your findings. Um, also, all of your peers will be up, up there, so that makes it even worse. And I will be sitting up at the top like an expectant father waiting for you to give birth. Okay? All right. I will be 10 times more nervous than you will, I promise you. Okay? All right. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the company, if that would be helpful, uh, just so you've got a bit of context. Um, work, place, uh, of which I was the CEO until June. Um, it's a software company that, was, when I took it over three years ago, was 27 years old. It was turning around over about nine million pounds, and it was basically just doing that. It was just living and breathing where it was, and it was losing money. It was backed by Lloyd's Development Capital, which is a private equity firm, part of Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, they had tried to buy another of my companies, which was a spin-out from Harriet Watt University, um, and I got to know them through that interaction. Um, they asked me to come and look at this business, and they said it's going to be salesforce.com for workforce management. You, you heard of salesforce.com? Salesforce.com is a massive and very rapidly going uh, Californian company, um, which makes a thing called CRM, Customer Relationship Management. So the whole process from somebody first visiting your website all the way through to them eventually buying something from you and being a repeat customer. Okay, so if you if you go and do that, uh, Amazon uses a CRM. The reason that Amazon knows who you are and will go back uh, and will make suggestions to you is it has a piece of software like this that profiles you, understands what you want, um, and encourages you to buy more by sending you irritating emails every 20 seconds. Yeah, so that's what Salesforce.com. Is. Go and look, look it up. It's a fantastic company. Um, then, uh, so we were going to be salesforce.com for workforce management. Workforce management is the discipline of, of trying to figure out which people you need to go and work in a particular place at a particular time. 
Has anyone ever shopped at H&M? Yeah? All Saints? New Look? Reese? Any of these places? Um, where do you buy your clothes? Where do you buy your clothes, apart from online? Which actual shops do you go to? Which one? Overgate. Okay. Never heard of it. Sorry, I'm too old. So. Okay, most fashion shops in the world use our software. Okay, all of these guys. The BBC uses our software, British Airways uses our software. The biggest company in the world, Walmart, uses our software. And what our software is trying to do is to say that the demand for labour in our stores, in fact, if you go into a Vodafone store, T Mobile, any of these places, they all, they all use the software as well. We need to know which mix of people we need to put into the store at any given time of the day. So how do you know you're supposed to be working? What we did was we built a mobile app um, so the uh, shop workers can go online, uh, they can register when they want to work, where they want to work, and the, our algorithm at the back calculates against the forecast of demand in 15 minute increments throughout the day, because demand goes up and it goes down, obviously. And Saturday is always busier than Monday, and Christmas is always busier than February. So this variability of demand, having to get the right mix of people with the right skills in the store to serve you and you and you, because if you walk into the store and you're ignored, you're going to be pissed off and you're not going to come back. If you walk into the store and someone meets you and greets you and says, hi, you're a size X, I've got something smashing, I can show you over here, or you're just browsing around and you can't find it and they come and help you, you're going to feel better about going into that store. So you might buy two t-shirts instead of one, um, you know, when you go to Hollister or whatever, right? And that is exactly what the owners of Hollister want you to do. They want you to buy two t-shirts instead of one, because that's how they make money. So our software is creating a different relationship between employer and employee, so that the employees who are hourly paid, high turnover, probably not got PhDs, um, are going to be more loyal to their employer and provide a better service to the customers. Yeah, because they feel better about being there because they're working when they want to work. Yep. So the, what I love about this company is it makes people's businesses perform better, but it actually makes the workers' lives better as well. Okay. So that's what Workplace does. It creates schedules or rosters um, for retailers, mostly, around, around the world. Okay? It's available in about 70 countries. It's used by about 350 companies. Um, and for example, the biggest H&M, we schedule 90,000 people a day for H&M in almost every country in the world, okay? where they have stores. So that's what Workplace does. Um, and you can go onto the website and take a look at it. Um, we sold the business in June to an American private equity house in New York called Insight Ventures and they've now merged it with another company, confusingly called Workforce. Um, so it's now about a $19 million business, okay, employing about 450 people um, and we have offices in uh, near London, uh, in Sydney, Australia and Chicago and Detroit uh, in the US. Um, okay. So it's a chunky business, um, it's growing rapidly, and product management was one of the first things I introduced to the business when I arrived. So when I arrived, I asked the head of engineering, how do you make decisions about what you're going to build? And he said, oh, we try not to do that. <laughs> Why not? It's a bloodbath. We do it once every six months, and then we go into a six month build cycle and do a release. And what happens when you release a software? Most people don't install it. Why not? Well, it's full of bugs. Okay, um, and it doesn't actually have everything we promised them it, it would have. So I phoned some of the customers. Dave Markley, who's the head of uh, workforce management at Rite Aid, which is a huge American, four and a half thousand stores. Um, it's a pharmacist, it's a, a chemist. Um, and I said, Dave, tell me about it. He said, oh, I never install your software. I wait for the idiots to do it, get rid of all the bugs, and then two months later, we'll take the release when it's been patched. So it's a bit of a car crash. And I got this story again and again and again and again. Okay, so I made them a promise. I said, we'll fix this uh, while we're fixing ev ev everything else. Three years later, actually 18 months later, but let's go to three years l l later, this product is released on time, on budget, every eight weeks. 
It has exactly what we promised our customers it would have in it, and it is virtually bug free. Everything works. They know when it's coming, they can plan ahead for it, and most of them now cannot wait for the next re release. The mobile app gets updated every two weeks, and the next generation of the software is released every four weeks. So we have this eight week cycle with the mobile app was 2222, the next gen goes 44, and the flagship product was 8 and so on. Totally predictable. People can plan, they can budget, that works for us internally and it works externally. That is thanks to engineering going agile and product management being in, introduced. Okay? Alright, so this has huge benefits to us, it has huge benefits to our customers. So let's have a look at what these two jobs are. So product management is a job title, product marketing is a job title. Okay. These are things you can search for on LinkedIn. Um, I'll tell you what else you could do. Have you ever heard of Glassdoor? Yeah? Put, who wants a job? Put your hand up. Okay. Go and look at Glassdoor. All right? That wasn't the question. Go and look at Glassdoor. Glassdoor is TripAdvisor for employees and prospective employees. Go onto Glassdoor, go into company and put workplace systems. Okay? We were, last year, we had reached 4.6 out of 5 stars. It works exactly like TripAdvisor. It's totally anonymous. So my staff get to comment on this business. Um, they can say what they like about it, what they don't like about it, and they get to give me advice. And they then rate the business and they, they rate the management and all that kind of thing. Almost every single person who's been on a course like yours, who goes and looks for a job, goes to Glassdoor first, out in the real world. Okay? I learned that it started in America and it's now here. So we, when I took the business over, we were 3.1 out of 5. Last year we got to 4.6. That officially made us the ninth best tech company in the whole of the UK to work for. We're now 4.8, so we're top 5. Okay, so if you want to know what good organisation looks like, the guys you're going to meet are part of an organisation of that quality. Okay? Also go to LinkedIn. So use LinkedIn and use Glassdoor. All right, and if you're going to start a company, the two guys are going to start a company, that's the best way to find talent, okay? Put up a glass door site and let people comment on it, because that's what good engineers will come and look for. All right, so the only mantra I'm going to give you is this one. I want you to read this really carefully, um, because it's a summary of everything that we have to do and everything that, that we have to learn. The market problem i.e. how do I get along here and yet still have a flat surface, right? That's my market problem. How do I want to buy it? Well, in your case, you don't need to buy it. You subscribe to come and do a degree course here, but the university buys it through a distributor. Um, the architect will specify it, and a distributor will come along with a catalog and say, we've got this one, this one, and this one, and that's called a sales channel, okay? So these two things are the things that matter the most. Okay, so what, the definition of a market is really, really clear. You need lots of people that have the same pain. Why? Demand. Demand. Right, so we can build it once and sell it. To everybody. Right, many, many times. Okay? Why do we need them to have money? To please buy it. Right. Why do we want them to talk to each other? Spread <coughs> Spread interest on it. Right, word of mouth, right? That kind of thing. Big markets are like a herd of wildebeest, right? You've seen it on the wildlife program. You know, a lion appears, the first one runs, and they all follow it. That is exactly, exactly how big markets behave. Otherwise, it would be impossible to reach people. If you don't have any pain, I'm not interested in you because you're just fat and rich, all right? <laughs> And you've got no worries and you don't care, so you know, you're in Monte Carlo now, you know, you've sold the business. If you have pain and no money, you're a bit sad because it ain't going to get any better, right? So I can't sell to you either. So I need people who have pain and money and who talk to each other. That's a market, okay? And that's how markets behave. There's two kinds of pain. I want something to stop, like a headache. I want something to happen, like I'm hungry, yeah? So, you can help people to make a problem go away, you can help people to achieve something that they couldn't otherwise achieve. In our case at Workplace, it's about helping retailers to sell more stuff to guys like you who walk in, into their stores. OK? 
Okay, that's what they want, want to achieve. In case of the um, employee, they want a better work-life balance. But make no mistake, the employee is not paying me any money. The employer is. Okay, so we have to get a balance between those two things. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, this is a generic structure of a software company. Um, and if you come into, um, you can quite often as an engineer come into, you know, when you've passed your degree, come into this part of the organization here and actually you can have quite an interesting career going down here and going in that direction there. And quite a few people do that if they are more commercial, less technical. So the guy who is chief customer officer at Workplace, Andrew Lloyd, my friend, uh, he's there. He went to Harriet Watt and did exactly the same degree as you did. Okay? And he just went in that, that direction there. Ewan, Ewan started here and he has gone to there. Okay? So you can have a really interesting career getting more and more and more commercial and having the technical skills that you, you will have from your degree as an underpinning is a fantastic way to start. Product management um, sits here. Okay? It doesn't sit under engineering. And the biggest mistake that I see people do when they start their businesses is put it into engineering. Can you think of a good reason why product management, bearing in mind it's going to facilitate us making decisions about what we're going to build, why should it not be in engineering? Maybe this is a person, but like, I could see myself making decisions based on like, how much we could be bothered actually making a silver difficult product as opposed to having an idea about a good product and, and then giving it over to tech people, for instance. Yeah, so what you, I mean, you know, you can give in engineers a sandbox to play, right? And that's what they will do. They'll play, right? And if they're uh, inquisitive, if they're intelligent, if they want to find stuff out, that's great. You can go and fiddle about and play and write code and see if it works or not and all that kind of stuff. And there's nothing wrong with doing that in your spare time. In the time when you're at work and you're being paid to cut code, you're being paid to produce a quality product that does what it says on the tin. Okay, so therefore, it's a good idea to get someone else to decide what we build, while engineers, architects, all these kind of dudes will figure out how we're going to build it, how are we going to structure it, okay? They are equally valuable pieces of a software company, but they need to be kept apart for everyone's sanity, all right? And the other thing about marketing is, what's your perception of what marketing generally does? What do you think a marketing department in a company does? You know what sales do. You know, they use trails of slime but they've been lying to you, don't they? I'm allowed to say that because I'm a salesman. It investigates the, the market for who your target audience is and how your audience reacts to a certain product that you're planning to release. It, it can do that, yeah. What else does marketing do? Who writes the emails that you get every day? Who makes the adverts? Hmm? So they promote. Yeah, they promote. How do they know what to promote? By doing social research. I mean, taking surveys, um, reading different types of data, and then asking people questions, and then based on that... By listening, right? Which is what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. You, you go Basically. to all kinds of different places and you listen. So there used to be a brand of um, headache tablet called Anadin. Okay, it's a form of aspirin. It was a branded drug rather than a generic drug. And it was very, very popular. The market leading product, certainly in the UK, in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Okay, when people would still pay a premium for essentially a headache pill. Right now, you go to Boots or a super drug and you get it for 49p. Right, in those days, you'd have paid a fiver for a packet. Okay, um, or the equivalent of a fiver. Anadin had an absolutely brilliant uh, marketing campaign. What they did was, they sat down a whole bunch of 25 to 45 year old women. Now we're in the 1950s, 60s, 70s here. Why did they do that? Because the women buy them. The women buy them. That's right. It's a little woman who goes out and does the shopping. That's her role in life, right? This is not now, this is then, okay? This is when I was born. So, the women did the shopping, the men went out and earned the money, right? Um, so, uh, the other reason that they didn't ask men is in those days, a man would never have admitted that he got a headache 
let alone how he felt about it. So they sat women down in what were called in those days focus groups. And it was literally a circle of 15 to 20 ladies. They were given a nice cup of tea and a biscuit, and they were asked um, about did they get headaches? How often did they get headaches? But how did you feel? And what they did was they took what they heard and played it back. And the advert was a silhouette of a lady's head with this incredibly sophisticated graphics throbbing like that. And it said, tense, nervous, headache, question mark. So there is the call to action. Do you get headaches? And do you feel tense and nervous when you get them? I do, I do, I do. What do you want to happen is the next question they asked them. And they said, I want it to go away quickly. The key word in the sentence was quickly. Of course you want it to go away. So the tagline was, nothing acts faster than anything. And that is 100% true. It's also true that nothing acts slower than anodine either, because all these drugs are absolutely identical. <laughs> but they position their product as understanding you, Mrs. Uh, generic aspirin drug buying housewife lady, um, as I can see you in the um, and understanding and having listened to you, they played back to exactly what you want to happen next. That is brilliant marketing. Okay, it sounds incredibly simple but it takes a long time to get that stuff. As a product manager, that's exactly what you need to understand. And what we'll, we're about to find out is that that, the, that message comes into the company from here. This person becomes the advocate for what we must do. And then this person here puts together the messages that go out um, and are actually designed by those people there. So that's what marketing does. It generates interest in your product. It generates leads. If you're selling to the consumer, you, can't, you don't get leads. You don't, you don't target individual human beings for packets of aspirin, right? But if you're selling business to business software, which we do, we know all the companies in the world of a particular profile and size, and we go and target them. And that's what our marketing does, okay? All right. Have I lost you, or is that okay? Okay. Now, we're on till when? Is it one o'clock? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll, okay, that's fine. So we'll carry on with some stuff here, then we'll go and get a cuppa, and then we'll come back and we'll do another hour, hour or so. Is that all right? Okay, no one's asleep yet. All right, so do you understand these terms? Are, are these f familiar to you from the rest of your degree? Does anybody, please say if you don't, because I can't help you if you don't know. Yeah, because they, every cheese, keep on reminding David that you might not know the cheese. Yeah, some of you do an MSc that's more like design type stuff. And well, it's like a conversation, yeah. but some they have to wake up beating background sometimes. Okay, so who doesn't understand any of those terms? Okay, which one don't you understand? Uh, I don't know what, what is Agile. Okay. Agile and what does it work for me? Okay, all right. So, um, essentially, this is how we used to make software. This is how we make software today. The difference is that in the past, <coughs> if the totality of a problem you were trying to solve looked like that, what people would do is they would understand all these bits and they would write them all down, okay? And they'd write them all down in a great big complicated document, okay? That went on for page after page after page. You would then take that and you would give it to your customer whether it's an internal or an external customer, and you would say, is that what you meant? And they would have to read this entire thing from start to finish, because this was the totality. This is an entire car. We've designed the whole car here, right, right at the beginning of the process. Then we get halfway through, and someone says, um, could we have four seats in this car? And you've designed a two-seater car, because that's what that said. And they went, yeah, we can sell it to families as well. Shit. <laughs> Six months later. So where, what do we have to do? We go back to the beginning. How often do you hear on the news that a government IT project for the health service or the Ministry of Defence is late and over budget? Yeah? Or for your driving licence re renewals. They're always late, they're always over budget. Because that's what they do. They think the clever thing to do is describe everything to the nth degree of detail 
throw it at somebody, make them build it, and have them come back and tell, tell you when you're finished. Okay, this is how we do Agile. <laughs> I want you to build that first, okay? And then a day or a week later, you come back and say, is that what you meant? And you went, oh, no, no, I need it to be like that. That's okay, that only takes a couple of hours to fix. Now we've done that bit, okay? So what we're doing is we're doing little bits at a time, yeah? Eventually we get there. But actually, if the first thing we build you could use, but it's not perfect, that's okay. You can still use it, all right? So you might pay me some money for that. A little bit of money. And then I'll build a better one and you pay me more money. And then we're both happy. So I don't have to wait two years to get the money. You don't have to wait two years to get a product, right? So having a faster horse is better than not getting a car, isn't it? Yeah? All right? Does that make sense? So, waterfall is big, old-fashioned, because people thought this is a safety net. Actually, it's usually a good way to trip up, right? It's more like barbed wire. Um, the sad thing is we still see, <coughs> see a lot of people doing it. Yeah. Projects in banks. Banks. <laughs> Projects in the health service. <laughs> Projects in government. <laughs> this stuff makes me have nightmares. All right, so what we try to do, um, the difference between enterprise and consumer is if you're selling a piece of software which is allowing you to play around with an avatar and <coughs> uh, socially interact with your buddies online using your avatar and their avatar, and if your avatar turns green, nobody's going to get hurt. If your software is running the command systems for the uh, uh, an aircraft and all the navigation systems go wrong and you get lost, a lot of people will get hurt. So the difference between this and this is that here you have to have a greater degree of certainty about what you're trying to do and how you're going to do it. Because here, although people get a bit hacked off, no one's going to get hurt. Okay? So we treat those things in a different way. So we're still going to be agile, Right? We're still going to say, we want to do this, oh, we might need to change it a bit, that's fine, but we can cope with that. We design a system so we can cope with change, okay, at the last minute. All right. So, typically, Waterfall, and this is what Workplace did when I arrived, we release product twice a year, okay? Actually, Workforce only releases it three times a year. They're, they have not made the Agile journey yet. Um, Typically, with Agile, you'll do stuff in one to three week periods. So the way that ours works, do you know what a sprint is? We all know about sprints? No? Yes? Right. The way that our eight weeks works is the first week is a planning week, right? Then we do two weeks of coding. Then we do another two weeks of coding, another two weeks of coding, and another two weeks of coding. Okay, and then we have a testing, packaging, and release week at the end. Okay, so that's our eight weeks. So we, we plan it and design it. We build and say, how does that look? Good. Build, how does that look? Good. Okay, and that's how we do it. So actually you're getting six weeks of effort actually cutting code. Okay, during every, out of every eight weeks. The reason we do the planning and the testing is for quality purposes. So the planning helps us to organize that and actually get more out of it. If we didn't do it, we would get less out of seven weeks than we do out of six, right? And the testing is there for quality purposes. So that is called a release. Within each one, we have a two-week sprint. So we're working within this, okay? Um, continuous deployment. Can you think of an example of something is like that? When did you last use Google? Today. Today. Right, every time you go into Google, it's changed pretty much. So it's different from yesterday than it, than it is today. And in the background, you don't see it, but they've changed something and they've developed something. Amazon, so the global Amazon development center for the interface that you use is where? Where do you think it is? Where's the headquarters of Amazon? Give me a country at least. Ireland? I mean, the, the global, global headquarters for I mean, Amazon. I mean, the one for Europe. No, where's the global headquarters for Amazon? California. Nearly. It's in Washington State. It's in Seattle. Okay? At the top left-hand corner of America. 
Okay? If you want a job, you guys need to start doing some research. Okay? Salesforce.com, Amazon, Google, start looking these companies up because they're good places to get a first job. Right? Learn more about them because you will impress people who interview you more if you can talk to them about their company. Just a wee piece of free advice. Okay. The head